Hello, squirrel listeners. Time to read. Chapter 10 is called Brothers and Sisters. I'm sure there'll be at least two parts, if not more. And I'm playing Blingo at the same time. So if you see me looking down occasionally, checking to see if my numbers have been called. So far, I've only got one out of six. Haven't won anything all day. <laughs> okay, chapter 10. Brothers and sisters. Polly's happiest day was Sunday, for Will never failed to spend it with her. Instead of sleeping later than usual that morning, she was always up bright and early, flying round to get ready for her guest. For Will came to breakfast, and they made a long day of it. Will considered his sister the best and prettiest girl going, and Polly, knowing well that a time would come when he would find a better and, and a prettier, was grateful for his good opinion and tried to deserve it. So she made her room and everything as neat and inviting as possible, and always ran to meet him with a bright face and a motherly greeting when he came tramping in, ruddy, brisk, and beaming, with the brown loaf and little pot of beans from the bakehouse nearby. They liked a good country breakfast, and nothing gave Polly more satisfaction than to see her big boy clear the dishes, empty the little coffee pot, and then sit and laugh at her across the ravaged table. Another pleasure was to let him help clear away, as they used to do at home, while the peals of laughter that always accompanied the, this performance did Miss Mills' heart good to hear. For the room was so small and Will so big that he seemed to be everywhere at once, and Polly and Puddle, P-U-T-T-E-L, the kitty cat, were continually dodging his long arms and legs. Then they used to inspect the flower pots. Uh, flower pots, flower pots. Pay Nick a visit and have a little music as a good beginning for the day. After which they went to church and dined with Miss Mills, who considered Will an excellent young man. If the afternoon was fair, they took a long walk together over the bridges into the country or about the city streets full of Sabbath quietude. Most people meeting them would have seen only an awkward young man with a boy's face atop his, of his tall body and a quietly dressed, fresh-faced little woman hanging on his arm. But a few people with eyes to read romances and pleasant histories everywhere found something very attractive in this couple and smiled as they passed, wondering if they were young lovers or country cousins looking round. If the day was stormy, they stayed at home, reading, writing letters, talking over their affairs, and giving each other good advice for... Though Will was nearly three years younger than Polly, he couldn't for the life of him help assuming amusingly venerable airs when he became a freshman. In the twilight, he had a good lounge on the sofa, and Polly sung to him, which arrangement he particularly enjoyed. It was so cozy and homey. At nine o'clock, Polly packed his bag with clean clothes, nicely mended, such remnants of the festive tea as were transportable and kissed him good night with many injunctions to muffle up his throat going over the bridge and to be sure his feet were warm and dry when he went to bed <coughs> all of which will laughed at accepted graciously and didn't obey but he liked it and trudged away for another week's work, rested, cheered, and strengthened by that quiet, happy day with Polly. For he had been brought up to believe in home influences, and this brother and sister loved one another dearly and were not ashamed to own it. One other person enjoyed the humble pleasures of these Sundays quite as much as Polly and Will, 
Maud used to beg to come to tea, and Polly, glad to do anything for those who had done a good deal for her, made a point of calling for the little girl as they came home from their walk, or sending Will to escort her in the carriage, which Maud always managed to secure if bad weather threatened to quench her hopes. Tom and Fanny laughed at, at her fancy, but she did not tire of it, for the child was lonely and found something in that little room which the great house could not give her. Maud was twelve now, a pale, plain child, with sharp, intelligent eyes and a busy little mind that did a good deal more thinking than anybody imagined. She was just at the unattractive, fidgety age when no one knew what to do with her, so let her fumble her way up as she could, finding a pleasure in odd things and living much alone, for she did not go to school because her shoulders were growing round, and Mrs. Shaw would not allow her figure to be spoiled. That suited Maud excellently, and whenever her father spoke of sending her again or getting a governess, she was seized with bad headaches, a pain in her back, or weakness of the eyes, at which Mr. Shaw laughed, but let her holiday go on. Nobody seemed to care much for plain pug-nosed little Maudie. Her father was busy, her mother nervous and sick, Fanny absorbed in her own affairs, and Tom regarded her, as most young men do their younger sisters, as a person born for his amusement and convenience, convenience nothing more. Maud admired Tom with all her heart and made a little slave of herself to him, feeling well repaid if he merely said, Thank you, chicken, or didn't pinch her nose or nip her ear, as he had a way of doing. Just as if I was a doll or dog and hadn't got any feeling, she sometimes said to Fanny when some service or sacrifice had been accepted without gratitude or respect. It never occurred to Tom when Maud sat watching him with her face full of wistfulness that she wanted to be petted as much as ever he did in his neglected boyhood, or that when he called her pug before people, her little feelings were as deeply wounded as his used to be when the boys called him carrots. He was fond of her in his fashion, but he didn't take the trouble to show it. So Maud worshipped him, afar off, afraid to betray the affection that no rebuff could kill or cool. One snowy Sunday afternoon, Tom lay on the sofa in his favorite attitude, reading... Reading what? Pen, pendinous for the fourth time, and smoking like a chimney as he did so. Maud stood at the window watching the falling flakes with an anxious countenance and presently a great sigh broke from her. Don't do that again, chicken, or you'll blow me away. What's the matter? asked Tom, throwing down his book with a yawn that threatened dislocation. I, I'm afraid I can't go to Polly's, answered Maud disconsolately. Hang on a second. See if I got any numbers. Ooh, I got a number. No, I don't. I'll gun it. Fifty-five, sorry, seven, eleven, fifteen. One number. <laughs> Blingo. Uh, you only laugh at me. Oh, wait a minute. Of course you can. It's snowing hard and Father won't be home with his carriage till this evening. What are you always cutting off the pollies for? I like it. We have such nice times, and Will is there, and we bake little Johnny cakes in the baker before the fire, and they sing, and it, it is so pleasant. Warbling Johnny cakes must be interesting. Come and tell me all about it. No, you'll only laugh at me. I give you my word I won't, if I can help it, <laughs> but I really am dying of curiosity to know what you do down there. You like to hear secrets, so tell me yours, and I'll be as dumb as an oyster. 
It isn't a secret, and you wouldn't care for it. Do you want another pillow? She added as Tom gave his a thump. This will do, but why you women always stick tassels and fringe all over a sofa cushion to tease and tickle a fella is what I don't understand. One thing that Polly does Sunday nights is to take Will's head in her lap and smooth his forehead. It rests him after studying so hard, she says. If you don't like the pillow, I could do that for you because you look as if you were more tired of studying than Will, said Maud, with some hesitation but an evident desire to be useful and agreeable. Well, I don't care if you... I don't care if you do try it, for I am confoundedly tired, and Tom laughed as he recalled the frolic he had been on the night before. Maud established herself with great satisfaction, and Tom owned that a silk apron was nicer than a fuzzy cushion. Do you like it, she asked, after a few strokes over the hot forehead, which she thought was fevered by intense application to Greek and Latin. Not bad. Play away, was the gracious reply as Tom shut his eyes and lay so still that Maud was charmed at the success of her attempt. Presently, she said softly, Tom, are you asleep? Just turning the corner. Before you get quite round, would you please tell me what a public admonition is? What do you want to know for, demanded Tom, opening his, opening his eyes very wide. I heard Will talking about publics and privates, and I meant to ask him, but I forgot. What did he say? I don't remember. It was about somebody who cut prayers and got a private and had done all sorts of bad things and had one or two publics. I didn't hear the name and didn't care. I only wanted to know what the words meant. So Will tells tales, does he? And Tom's forehead wrinkled with a frown. No, he didn't. Polly knew about it and asked him. Will's a dig, growled Tom, shutting his eyes again, as if nothing more could be said of the delin delinquent William. I don't care if he is. I like him very much, and so does Polly. Happy fresh, said Tom with a comical groan. You needn't sniff at him, for he is nice and treats me with respect, cried Maud. With the inner... Within... Eh... Mm, with an energy that made Tom laugh in her face. Hang on. We got any new numbers? V's is talking, talking, talking. Nope. No more numbers. Okay. I don't care if he's happy fresh, said Tom with a kind. You needn't sniff at him, for he is nice. Oh, made Tom laugh in her face. He's good to Polly always and puts on her cloak for her and says, My dear, and kisses her good night. And don't think it is silly, and I wish I had a brother just like him. Yes, I do. And Maud showed signs of woe for her disappointment about going was very great. Bless my boots, what's this chicken ruffling up her feathers and pecking at me for? Is that the way Polly sues the best of brothers? said Tom, still laughing. Oh, I, for I forgot. I forgot. There, I won't cry, but I do want to go, and Maud swallowed her tears and began to stroke again. Now, Tom's horse and sleigh were in the stable, for he meant to drive out to college that evening, but, uh, but he, didn't, he didn't take Maud's hint. It was less trouble to lie still and say in a conciliatory tone, Tell me more about this good boy. It's very interesting. No, I shan't, but I'll tell about Puddles playing on the piano, said Maud anxious to efface the memory of her momentary weakness. Polly, uh, 
Polly points to the right key with a little stick, and Puddle sits on the stool and plays each key as it's touched, and it makes a tone. So funny to see her and Nick. Uh, and Nick perches on the rack and sings as if he'd kill himself. <laughs> Very thrilling, said Tom in a sleepy tone. Maud felt that her conversation was not as interesting as she hoped and tried again. Polly thinks you are handsomer than Mr. Sidney. Much obliged. I asked what she thought which she thought had the nicest face face and she said yours was the handsomest and his the best does he ever go there ask a sharp voice behind them and looking round maud saw fanny in the big chair cooking her feet over the register i never saw him there he sent up some books one day and will teased her about it what did she do demanded fanny Oh, she shook him? No, that's not a question. What did she do? Oh, she shook him. What a spectacle, and Tom looked as if he would have enjoyed seeing it, but Fanny's face grew so forbidding that Tom's little dog, who was approaching to welcome her, put his, uh, put his tail between his legs and fled under the table. Then there isn't any spark Sparkling, no, sparking Sunday night, sung Tom, who appeared to have walked, waked up again. Of course not. Pa Polly isn't going to marry anybody. She's going to keep house for Will when he's a minister. I heard her say so, cried Maud, with importance. What a fate for pretty Polly, ejaculated Tom. She likes it, and I'm sure I should think she would. It's beautiful to hear them plan, plan it all out. Any more gossip to retail, Pug? Asked Tom in a, in, uh, asked Tom a minute after as Maud seemed absorbed in visions of the future. He told a funny story about blowing up one of the professors. You never told us, so I suppose you didn't know. Some bad fellas put a torpedo or some sort of powder thing under the chair, and it went off in the midst of the lesson, and the poor man flew up, frightened most to pieces, and the boys ran after. Uh, no. And the boys ran with pails of water to put the fire out. But the thing that made Will laugh most was that the very fellow who did it got his trousers burnt trying to put out the fire. And he asked, uh, he asked the is. Uh, now I'm lost. Dang, just read that. It's funny. Mm, put the fire out. Put the thing out. Either will do. Well, he asked him to give him some new ones, and they did give him money enough for a nice pair. But he got some cheap ones with horrid great stripes on them and always wore them to that particular class, which was one too many of the fellows, Will said. And with the rest of the money, he had a punch party. Wasn't it dreadful? Awful, and Tom exploded into a great laugh that made Fanny cover her ears and the little dog bark wildly. Did you know that bad boy? Asked Innocent Mild slightly, gasped Tom, in whose wardrobe at college those identical trousers were hanging at that moment. Uh, Don't make such a noise. My head aches dreadfully, said Fanny fretfully. Girls' heads always do ache, answered Tom, submitting from, from a roar into a chuckle. What pleasure you boys can find in such ungentlemanly, ungentlemanly things, I don't see, said Fanny. 
who was definitely out of sorts. As much a mystery to you as it is to us how you girls can like to gabble and prank from one week's end to the other, retorted Pom. <laughs> retorted Tom. There was a pause after this little passage at arms, but Fan wanted to be amused, for time hung heavily on her hands. So she asked in a more amiable tone, How's tricks? As sweet as ever, answered Tom gruffly. Did she scold you as usual? She just did. What was the matter? Well, I'll leave it to you if this isn't unreasonable. She won't dance with me herself, yet don't like me to go to go it with anybody else. I said I thought if a fella took a girl to a party, she ought to dance with them once at least, especially if they were engaged. She said that was the very reason why she shouldn't do it. So at the last hop, I let her alone and had a gay time with Belle, and today Trix gave it to me hot and heavy coming home from church. If you go and engage yourself to a girl like that, I don't know what you can expect. Did she wear her Paris hat today? Added Fan with sudden interest in her voice. And I'm going to stop right there. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. Crafty or just relaxing. I'm going to finish Blingo if nobody's won yet. Doesn't look like I've got any more numbers. <laughs> it's okay. Y'all be sweet. Don't be ugly. And I hope to see you tomorrow live at 5. Love you. Bye.